Hello everybody and welcome back to another radiology tutorial. Today we're going to be discussing how to understand and interpret DWI diffusion weighted images and ADC maps, apparent diffusion coefficient maps. Now this actually isn't a confusing topic but I find people get confused all the time when trying to interpret these images and it's my hope that by the end of this talk you'll never be confused again when faced with a DWI or an ADC image. So let's have a look at this image. This is a DWI image of the brain obviously and my feeling I may be wrong is many people will rote learn that a bright region on a DWI image such as this region here represents restricted diffusion and but that goes with saying that a dark region like the CSF here represents free diffusion of molecules in that region on the image and vice versa for ADC maps people wrote learn that a dark region means restricted diffusion and a light re region means free diffusion of molecules in that area and for the most part you'll be pr you'll be correct 95% of the time you're going to be right but there's a problem one with rote learning things that when there's an exception to the rule you're going to be caught out and if we want to be better radiologists, if we want to be confident at looking at images, or if we want to problem solve, if something doesn't make sense in the image that we're seeing, we need to peel back, we need to go one layer deeper. And the only way we're going to do that is by delving into some of the physics, I promise I'll keep it light, and some of the maths underlying these images. So if we have a look at this image, we can see that the grey matter here is actually lighter on the image than our white matter. That means that this is a T2 weighted image. So why then is the CSF dark in this image? There must be an underlying principle. And if you find yourself not being able to answer that, then it's actually worthwhile going down another layer, stepping into the physics, and really understanding how we acquire these images. So in order to do that, I'm going to enlist the help of a trusty chopstick and just explain to you how we go about acquiring this image. Now this is a simplification, and I hope it's not an oversimplification of how we uh, get these images but my goal here is that you gain some intuition you gain some understanding and you can problem solve when things don't look right on the image so how we acquire any MRI as you may know is that we apply a really large electromagnetic field along the patient so say their head is here and their feet are here we apply this strong electromagnetic field and what it does is our free floating hydrogen ions in our body then get affected by this external electromagnetic field and it causes those hydrogen atoms to lie parallel to that electromagnetic field. And because of their innate angular momentum, whilst they're lying parallel to the field, they will process around a little axis like this. So we can imagine our hydrogen atom sitting here along the electromagnetic field, precessing like this. So now we have all our hydrogen atoms along the same plane precessing. And what we want to do is measure changes to that hydrogen atom when we apply external different electromagnetic forces to that hydrogen ion. So if we have a look at our DWI sequence here, the first thing that we do now to change the orientation of this hydrogen atom is apply what's called an RF, a radio frequency pulse. And I've labeled it 90 there because the strength and the direction of this radio uh, frequency pulse will mean that this precessing hydrogen atom will precess further and further and further until it is at 90 degrees to that external electromagnetic field. Now that does two things. The first thing it does is it allows us to have a sensor on the outside of our MRI machine that can now pick up the signal that this hydrogen ion is giving off. The reason we can't do it here is that if we had a sensor here, all we would measure is that large electromagnetic field that we've placed across the patient. The fact that we flip that to 90 degrees and it's perpendicular to that electromagnetic field means that we can now measure that signal and it's that what gi that gives us a signal on an MRI image. The second thing it does is all the hydrogen uh, atoms that we're processing around a point, when they're exposed to this RF pulse, they start to process in sync and that's what we call in phase. All of our hydrogen atoms are now giving off signal at exactly the same time. They're what we call in phase. Well, you can imagine that measuring the signal given off by one hydrogen atom in the human body is going to be very difficult. If you have all the hydrogen atoms then giving off that 90 degree signal at the same time, you can imagine that that is much easier to measure. And how we measure that signal is a function of how much, if you think of this as a vector, how much y-axis signal we get. So if an atom is sitting perpendicular at 90 degrees, we get maximum signal. The lower down that comes, 
the less signal we get. And you're going to see why that becomes important. So first, let's have a look at a, a particle that's going to be stationary. So we've, we've said there's restricted diffusion within this bright region here. So if we're taking a particle there, and we want to see what happens to a stationary particle when we're doing a DWI sequence. We've already flipped our hydrogen atom to 90 degrees. Then what we do is we do apply this uh, diffusion gradient across in one plane across the image or across the patient. I'm going to label this B and you'll see why just now. Now what the diffusion gradient does is it causes that hydrogen uh, atom that's been flipped to 90 degrees, it causes it to lose some of its signal. So instead of giving off its full y-axis, now the particle that we've exposed it to a gradient has lost some signal. So we've applied that B, that diffusion gradient. Then what we do is we apply another RF pulse that's twice the magnitude of our initial RF pulse, and it causes this hydrogen atom, you've got to picture it, it's precessing like this now, giving off this much signal. It causes it to flip 180 degrees, so now it's precessing like this. This particle hasn't moved. It's still being exposed to the same uh, forces that are, that, that's causing it to flip. So now we're precessing like this. Then what we do is we apply an equal and opposite diffusion gradient here. So this is our second B. So we have our hydrogen now precessing like this. We apply an equal and opposite diffusion gradient, which then causes that hydrogen atom to again be in that 90 degree plane right on our y-axis giving maximum signal. So a stationary particle that hasn't moved, as you can see in the image, is giving us a bright signal. It's giving us maximum signal. So let's go across to a freely diffusing particle. Let's go into a molecule. Let's go into our CSF there. We know that CSF moves randomly with Brownian motion. We've done the same thing. We've applied our RF signal. We've got it to 90 degrees. It's giving off maximum signal. Then what we do is we've applied our diffusion gradient, same as before. Now two things happen. Firstly, this particle is moving and diffusion gradient, it's, it's a change over time, is specific to the region that it is on the, that, that atom is in the image. If that atom were to move, it experiences that diffusion gradient differently. There's a different magnitude of that force. So instead of applying our diffusion gradient and it takes us to a specific point, as we move, it causes either more uh, uh, loss, even more loss of signal or less loss of signal. But it, the key here is that it experiences the diffusion gradient differently. The second thing it does is it causes our uh, molecules that were in phase, if it were to move and we were experiencing different electromagnetic forces, those particles then become out of phase. And you can imagine that out of phase particles give off next to no signal because you can have some giving off a negative, some giving off a positive, two varying degrees of amplitude of signal. So not only have we lost signal, but we've also lost phase, and both those mechanisms cause the signal to be reduced. So now we've lost signal, lost phase, and we've lost uh, magnitude of this, this y-axis. Then we apply our 180 degree flip, and then we apply our equal and opposite diffusion gradient. You'll see that we'll, we're not going to come back to 90 degrees. If the particle moved one way in the image, maybe we get a bit more than 90. If the particle moved another way in the image, maybe we get a bit less than 90. But either way, we're getting less signal. One, from the reduced amplitude, and two, from that out-of-phase movement of those particles. And that's the essence to the DWI sequence. We can see that particles that move within the image are going to lose signal. Particles that are stationary are going to come exactly back to that 90 degree and give us a really high signal reading. So, that's all good and well because we've seen that uh, particles diffuse randomly, but there's some particles that actually don't diffuse randomly. If you take a, a hydrogen atom in an axon, it might be able to move really easily one in one direction, but then not be able to move in the Y plane or the Z plane, and it can move along the X plane. And how we get away a, a with this and how we negate for these options is we will actually run multiple sequences with diffusion gradients in at least a minimum of three orthogonal planes. So we'll diffusion gradient along the y-axis, along the uh, x-axis, and along the z-axis. And if we take an average of those diffusion gradients, then we will get what is the true diffusion in that tissue. Now in practice, we will do that 
six to 20 times. So it won't just be those three orthogonal planes, but at a minimum, that is what we need to get our composite DWI image. We actually take an average of all those images and the signal that we see there is uh, our true diffusion gradient within the image. So I promised there would be a little bit of maths and I want to tell you, to show you what contributes actually to that DWI image. First of all, as we saw in that first image, a DWI image is a T2 weighted image. The, the way we acquire that image is in the sequence of T2, which means that our gray matter is gonna show brighter than our white matter and inherent, the inherent properties of each of the different tissues are gonna give off signal as a T2 signal. The other thing that we've discussed as well that gives off signal is our actual diffusion properties of the tissue. So as we can see from this image here, from this equation here, what contributes to signal? Firstly, it can be the inherent T2 properties of the tissue, and that's what we call T2 shine through, or it can be our apparent diffusion coefficient or our actual diffusion in the tissue that's gonna give signal. So if we see something that's bright on a T2 image, how do we know it's bright because of restricted diffusion? And how do we know it's bright because that maybe that mass is inherently bright on T2? We need to have a way of figuring out how we can get rid of that T2 signal and be left with only our apparent diffusion coefficient. This is what we're trying to solve for. This is our unknown. We want to know what is the apparent diffusion within that tissue. Now, as you saw earlier, I labeled this diffusion gradient B like this, and that's because in this equation, here is our diffusion gradient. So we have our T2 signal timed by the negative exponent of B, the diffusion gradient that we apply, and the inherent apparent diffusion coefficient of that actual uh, tissue. So what we have here is we can see that as our diffusion uh, increases, as we have more diffusion here, our DWI decreases. Our CSF, we've got lots of diffusion because, of its, it's, because it's a negative exponent. As our ADC increases, our DWI decreases and vice versa. As our ADC restricts, we get DWI lighting up. So our D brightness on DWI can be T2 shine through or it can be this restriction within a fluid. So let's go about now trying to get rid of that T2 signal. And this is what's known as our B0 image. If we were to not do B here, we were not to give it gradient diffusion, what in fact we're doing is just acquiring a T2 image. And you can see that if we were to make B equal to zero in this equation, E would be to the power of zero. Anything to the power of zero is one, so it would be T2 times one. What we have here is basically a T2 weighted image. It's still the same sequence as a DWI, but we haven't applied that diffusion gradient. And if we were to then divide this image, this trace image that we've got here, and we were to divide it by this B0 DWI image, our T2s would cancel each other out. And what we'd be left with is E to the negative B diffusion gradient and ADC. And what we can do then is isolate the ADC, solve for ADC, because we know what B is. Say we've done B of a thousand, we, the only thing that we don't know now is ADC. And we'll do that, you don't need to know this equation, but you can see once we've isolated ADC and we've divided our initial DWI image by our B0 uh, DWI image, it gives us an ADC map that is our DWI. You can see it's in, in the inverse because as ADC goes up, DWI goes down, but it's taken out our T2 contributions because we divided that. So you can see here that an ADC image actually isn't a sequence. It's a mathematical equation. What we've done is we've taken our DWI sequence and divided that. We've taken the signal from our B0 image and our DWI image. We've divided them, canceling out the T2 effects. And that's why our ADC image is often quite square and grainy. It's because it's a mathematical formula that's creating our ADC image. So here we have three images. They're all the same patient. Our initial image is our B0 image, B equals zero. So you can see here that this is a T2 image. We've got bright CSF, we've got a bright lesion, and we've got um, brighter gray matter than we do white matter. This is a classic T2 image. But this tells us nothing about the diffusion of the tissues. Is this mass here filled with water and it's bright because this is a T2 image? Or is it something like in this case, an abscess, which has got restricted diffusion and is just bright on T2. So what we then need to do is our DWI images. 
we've applied a diffusion gradient in all three planes and we've got this image here. We can see that water is freely diffusing and we can see here that there's restricted diffusion within that uh, lesion. Or is it restricted diffusion? We don't actually know because that could be the inherent T2 properties of that lesion. Our DWI image is bright when there's either T2 shine through or there's actual true restricted diffusion and that's why we need the ADC image. We can see here it's much more grainy, much less definition, you're not going to get great anatomical detail here, but we can see in our ADC image our apparent diffusion coefficient is decreased, we've got decreased diffusion within our lesion here, you can actually see some increased diffusion around it representing likely some edema that we can't really see too well on our DWI image, and we can see now our CSF that's surrounding the brain and in our ventricles is freely diffusing. Our apparent diffusion coefficient is really high there and we can see diffusion. So why wouldn't we look at ADC alone? I mean, we can look at the ADC and say, we know that there's no T2 and we know that dark represents restricted diffusion. The problem here is ADC is a mathematically calculated image. It's not the actual image. If anything was to go wrong in our B0 image, say we had an artifact here in our B0 image, say we had some carryover um, and we had a dark region here, that would be carried through in the mathematics. We wouldn't see it on our DWI image because uh, that artifact may have gone. We've acquired, we've taken two acquisitions, one to get our B0 and one to get our DWI. But it would carry through into our ADC map and we would have a lesion here. Now, do we trust that ADC? Well, we can't trust it unless we've looked at our B0 image and we've looked at our DWI image. And it's for that reason that we can't look at a DWI image in isolation because it could be T2 shine through or it could be a T, uh, it could be restricted diffusion. And we can't look at an ADC map in isolation because any error within those uh, initial images will carry through mathematically and be represented on our ADC map. And it's it's clear to see that when you are assessing these images, we can't look at them in isolation. We need to know what the B0 looks like, we need to know what the DWI looks like, and we need to know what the ADC looks like. And from there, it's really simple. We can tell with confidence whether there is re true restriction within a mass in the brain or within a region of the brain, say in a stroke. So I hope that I haven't confused you there. I hope you've gained some intuition as to how we create these signals and how we create these images. And if you've enjoyed this lecture and you found it useful and you've learned anything, then please hit the like button and perhaps subscribe to the channel. There are going to be more and more videos. We're committing to uh, releasing a whole bunch of videos in the, in the near future. So I uh, thank you. If you've got this far, thank you for joining me. I hope this has helped and I'll see you all in the next video. Goodbye, everybody.